Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining another uh, episode of the Ketonian Corner. I'm Jolene Hale, and I'm here with my co-host, John Davidson. Do I always say hello, hello? I do. Uh, I think you do. Okay, well, maybe that's my tagline from now on. I'll just always say hello, hello. All right. Um, we are here um, interviewing Dan Bell Richard, um, and he is the owner or one of the owners of the Sogo Snacks. And these are um, some snacks that John and I were fortunate enough to get to test uh, during KetoCon. Uh, Dan was one of the vendors, so we've asked if he would uh, be willing to let us interview him. So we're pretty excited about it. Hello, Dan. Hello, Jolene. Hello, John. Nice to nice to be here. Yeah. Thank you for joining us. Yeah. So um, I, I think uh, I think if you wouldn't mind, would you just give us a little background at how you ended up at, at KetoCon in the first place? Sure. Uh, well, I had started my snack company about a year ago in August of 2016, and this was after working in the uh, grass-fed beef industry for a couple of years, and um, I was I had been selling my product on Amazon and on my website, and really we developed the product just to to have a, a healthy, clean label, uh, low sugar or no sugar product, and. One of my customers actually in Ohio reached out to me and asked if I was going to be attending the, the KetoCon conference. And at that point, I had never heard of the ketogenic diet. I had never heard of KetoCon. But uh, she said that, you know, this would be great for folks uh, using or following the keto diet. And so I looked it up and found the Keto Evangelist and contacted them. And this was prior to really any information being out there on the conference or vendors and emailed Robin and I got on their list. And, and that led me to KetoCon 2017 in Austin, Texas. So if you um, weren't in Keto to begin with, the grass fed is still a pretty good niche. How did you end up um, kind of falling into that market from, uh, from more of a company side? Because grass-fed sure. beef is, is, uh, is definitely something that's becoming more and more mainstream, but it sounds like when you started, that would have been pretty, uh, I guess, fringe, for lack of a better term. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I, you know, I live in a small town of 8,000 people in northeast Iowa, and I was working as the sustainability director for a, a, a local college, Luther College, and had been doing that for several years, and one of their focuses was on local food or, or healthier food, sustainable food practices, and one of the efforts was increasing the amount of grass-fed uh, beef that was used in the cafeteria. Uh, at the same time, one of my good friends and his wife had started a grass-fed beef company just outside of, of our town, and um, he had been trying to recruit me to come work for his company as it was growing. They were in, in the ground floor of the, the grass fed business in 2005. And in 2014, I kind of just took a leap of faith, quit my job uh, at the college, started working for him. And there uh, I, I developed a similar line of product uh, within the grass fed beef industry. And, you know, how small businesses oftentimes go. He was bought out by a, a very large company. That, that took over uh, the, the brand. And once that happened, uh, the same ethics and values that we held as a company uh, weren't quite, quite as closely guarded. And at that time, I decided to just really take another leap of faith and, and start my own company doing what I was doing uh, previously, but under my own brand and developing some, some new recipes. So um, I've, so I, I've uh, had the experience of trying to do some grass-fed beef because of a cow I got in the processing place I was at, and I was shocked when I found out the amount of stuff that they put in those kind of uh, to, to keep them shelf-stable and all that stuff. So, so you, one of the reasons you said your product was clean was because you're, t like, uh, you're talking about MSGs and those type of things. So can you kind of Kind of like let me know what 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 differentiates your product behind, behind like something I would just find on the sh short show that sh the shelf at my local uh, you know grocery store. Sure. Uh, well, you know one of the one of the aspects that that we you know consider clean is not having any allergen 
vegetables in there. So there, there's no soy, there's uh, no dairy products, there's no nut products. So uh, just in, in regards to that, uh, it, it's clean. Uh, as far as sugar goes, it's really hard to find a meat snack out there, especially a shelf-stable meat snack out there that does not have sugar in it. And part of the reason for that is the, the sugar helps with the pH balance of the product and getting that pH balance to the, to the right level. So it is a shelf-stable product and you don't have to worry about it spoiling over time um, or in the packaging and creating any issues that way. So the, those two challenges. And then in addition, oftentimes meat sticks are really an afterthought for companies. Um, it's, a, it's a large meat company that has excess trim or um, and, and they're finding a way to add value to it. And so what they do is, is they take the, the excess trim, either of beef or pork or chicken, combine them all together. They're looking on the commodity market, where can they get this for the, the, the cheapest price possible, turning it into a product in, in, in a way to make it taste good. They're, they're adding MSG, they're using sugar, they're using some of those unpronounceable ingredients to, to really allow it to be a shelf-stable product but then taste good because maybe the raw materials going into it aren't the, uh, the best raw materials. And, and, then they, and, they, and then they sell it on the market. And it's, so it's making it as cheap as possible and trying to sell it for as much as they can uh, in order to turn something that was you know, a low-value a low item into something that, that brings a profit to the company. Our, our philosophy is different. Um, this isn't an afterthought. This is the, the product that we are making. And so we're sourcing the, the highest quality goods that we can to put into this meat stick. And we're doing it also with the thought of we want to produce as healthy of meat stick as possible. And um, because of that, our, our costs are higher but we feel like the product that we make is a, a much healthier, a much cleaner, uh, and a much better product. And um, that's what sets us apart from the conventional beef sticks that you would find in the industry. Nice. It sounds like uh, nutrition is, is really important to you guys. Yeah, exactly. So we don't follow any one specific diet uh, in our family. Um, we, you know, we have tried Whole30 and, and have done that. Um, we have tendencies to eat paleo or keto, but it's not a specific discipline that we follow. Uh, we're just more moderation. You know, if we can buy local, we buy local. If we can buy something that's produced sustainably, we you know we we purchase that. And so it, it's it's part of the decision process. You know, with finances and what you can afford and what's available to you and and what you choose to eat but that's that's kind of the philosophy our family's been following yeah so um with your company is this um a family-run business or do you, do you have um other employees as well no so at this point it's just me running the company um and so obviously i'm not raising the beef myself um I, I've teamed up with a company that is supplying raw material for me. And actually, my my years previously working in the grass-fed beef industry really served me well when trying to source the best raw material um, that I, I believe and know has the same values that, that I have. And, I mean, the... Similar to the organic world, um, the grass-fed beef industry, as larger companies get involved in, in, in selling that as a product, um, some of the values and attributes associated with, with the grass-fed beef can be lost. And uh, so I'm, I was very careful in choosing uh, my raw material supplier to make sure that the attributes of the grass-fed beef that consumers um, believe and understand that they're getting is, is actually true. And then uh, I also work with a family smokehouse that, that makes the product. Um, it's a, an extremely difficult 
process actually and especially when you're you're making something without sugar uh, it's it's very challenging but i had the good fortune of meeting a family smokehouse that was willing to take the recipes that i developed and uh, the t- suppliers of the raw material that that i established relationships with and, and make that product for me uh, and so then we take it back to our warehouse, and that's where I'm in there fulfilling orders and preparing shipments and doing the customer service, doing the marketing, bookkeeping. So right now it's a one-man show. Uh, my wife, she, she'll help out uh, with some, some some of the marketing and some of the fulfillment as, as well. And I actually have three young daughters, two of which are uh, seven and eight years old. And so they'll sometimes come in there and help me slap labels on the packages and, and fulfill orders with me or do demos at some of the co-ops or other grocery stores that we go to. So, yeah, right now it's just a, it's a, it's a one-man show with a little bit of help from the family, but we're as, as small as you get, I guess, when you talk about a, a family-run business. So were you able to pass or distill some of those values you talked about earlier on your kids? If they're you know, to help you with those demos and stuff, that sounds like a pretty good opportunity for your children. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, you know, I, I grew up in a, a really blue-collar um, family, and I started uh, delivering papers as uh, an 8-year-old and did that um, through the age of 16 until I got more conventional jobs. And so having a strong work ethic and knowing the, the value of money was, you know, really important to me. And it was something that I wanted to pass on to my children. And um, so having them help out, I think, really does uh, um, give them a, a better sense of, of money. But then in addition, like what you're saying, we were just at a, a small co-op in Minneapolis, Minnesota on Saturday uh, demoing our product. And so they were they were there cutting cutting the samples out and toothpick and learning about the the health regulations and and what you need to do in order to do it properly. But then um, they were you know there listening to me interacting with the uh, the customers that were stopping by and getting samples and learning about our product. And I actually you know had to to step away and, and do some other things just for a very brief period of time. So you know I told them you're in charge. And I came back, and when I came back, they were like, oh, we had some customers come, and they were asking us all these questions, and we told them, uh, you know, about the nutritional information and where they can find it in the store and, you know, some of the attributes about our product. And then about 10 minutes later, uh, the, the customer that they were talking to came up to me and just gave me a really big compliment on how well they did um, promoting the product and actually understanding the product. So you're exactly right. It's It's something that um, it gets instilled into them. And it's actually, it's funny you know, hearing them talk about food a little bit as well and looking at nutritional labels of the food that we have in our house. And one of the things that, you know, because we have products that don't have sugar and that's a, a, a big interest in a lot of our uh, customers. So they're always looking at what's the sugar and how much or what's the sodium, how much, what's the fat content. <laughs> so it's pretty interesting to hear that, you know, from eight and seven-year-olds. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. See, it just it doesn't stop there though. You guys have like a college program too, don't you? Yeah, so you know, we realize that grass-fed beef and the product that we provide is not necessarily inexpensive. And especially when you're comparing it to the traditional meat stick that that has all this, you know, the stuff that you don't want in it. But it, it's there's still a big contrast or there can be and so this was actually something that uh, an intern helped me develop. I was a college student that uh, I had gotten to know from my previous work at, at the, the college in town. And so we were figuring, trying to figure out how can we you know, introduce our product to uh, customers or younger customers that are especially interested in eating more sustainably uh, and eating um, more healthy, healthy than uh, maybe previous generations, but don't quite have the buying power yet. And so we started the, the college student discount program. And what we have is we have these, um, they're, they're called beef bites. And so when we're making our sticks, uh, we're making them in seven foot long casings and then cutting these nice seven inch sticks to, to package and then sell. Well, when you do that, uh, there are little ends that get cut off or 
or, or little, you know, maybe they're a little crooked or something that they, they don't make the cut to go into the, the, the commercial stick. So then we package those up in four ounce um, packages and through the college discount program, we sell those to college students at a 50% off um, rate. And so they're able to get uh, a four ounce packages of grass fed beef sticks for about two dollars and fifty cents delivered um, to their door, and so it's it's a way to to introduce or at least allow um, that that demographic the ability to purchase um, food that they're actually interested in and want to purchase. Yeah, I'm impressed. I w- where were you when I was in college? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's I mean it's extremely popular. The college students love them, and and they're great for that type of lifestyle when you're you know running around and studying and involved in, you know, athletics or extracurricular activities. You might not be able to get to the cafeteria when you want to, or and so this is a, it's a great, a great uh, snack that they can keep in their, in their book bags or their gym bags and um, have that available. We actually just started, you know, we do donations too. And so we're actually donating um, our beef bites to food shelves uh, in the area, and we're actually even don- donating them to some college athletic programs. So, like, for instance, the cross country team, they go out on a long run, uh, and before they can get back and get to the cafeteria, the coaches are then giving those to their stu- uh, their their athletes as a as a high source of protein, has iron in it, and then it's just something to kind of tide them over until they get to the cafeteria. You talked a little bit about the bites, but we never really talked about your real products. <laughs> I guess we kind of sure. I, so I, I took us so deep into the into the uh, process and the in the company that so you have more than one flavor. So you, you're talking started talking about the sticks. So what what are your, what are the options do you have with the sticks and everything? Yeah, so we started off with three flavors. Uh, two of the flavors, the jalapeno and the original flavor. Uh, have no sugar in them, and um, the the third flavor is our smoky sweet flavor. It does have uh, two grams of sugar in it. Uh, it's still a pretty low amount of sugar, but we didn't want. I guess there are some people that just they want food with sugar in it, and it can really add to the to the flavor profile. And so we chose to have uh, at least one product that contains sugar in it, and and that's what we started with, just to kind of test the concept and see if we could make this a, a viable business. And we were seeing, um, we were getting some good comments and seeing success with doing that. And so we've started to then increase our offerings. And uh, the latest product that we just came out with is a chimichurri flavor, uh, which is, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but they use it in South America and Uruguay or Argentina specifically. Uh, when they're grilling, it's a kind of a sauce or almost a marinade that that they use when when grilling um, meat, and so it has a, a real strong um, basil and parsley and oregano uh, flavor profile to it. So that was our most recent one. That does not have any sugar in it as well. We're trying to um, come up with flavors that maybe aren't necessarily traditional beef stick flavors at this point. We realize. Um, our customers are, you know, maybe foodies isn't the exact term to, to describe them, but they're 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 looking for for some interesting flavors and uh, real healthy snacks. Uh, the other thing that uh, a couple of other flavors or, or sticks that we, we've been trying out is a, a Tex-Mex flavor. And, yeah, and that's meat. so funny you just said that because we were looking at each other. We're like, what was that new flavor that we tried? I think pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So the Tex-Mex flavor, that we had received our first sample run of that prior, just prior to going to uh, KetoCon. And so we took that down along with our original beef bar. Uh, beef bar is, is you know, slightly different than a, a beef stick. It, it uses a little bit uh, leaner product, which I know in the keto diet may not be preferred, but... Uh, it, it's made without a, a casing, and so it needs to be leaner in order to kind of hold its shape. But the Tex-Mex flavor, we did a first run, and we we're getting feedback with uh, with uh, the folks down at KetoCon, and and maybe it's because we were in Austin, Texas, or maybe it was just you know, true. But everyone wanted a little bit more spice or heat to that yeah. flavor. Uh, everyone really liked it, but they said oh, maybe just a little bit more heat would be good. And so we came back. And um, 
we reformulated. We added a little bit of habanero, so we're trying to increase the heat about 10%. Uh, and then we just put together that spice mixture, and we have it down at the family smokehouse that we work with. And he is going to be doing uh, another uh, sample run. And so we're going to be able to taste that and see how it, how if the heat level is, you know, maybe more to what we want it to be. And if all goes well, then we're going to be going through the USDA label approval process and hopefully have that to market in about two to three months. Fantastic. I, yeah. I, I'm looking forward to that because that, I was one of those people that gave you the feedback because it, it stand a little bit more of a kick. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, that's, I mean, that's what's nice about being a small company. Um, we can, you know, take feedback very easily from customers and then immediately put it into a product. Um, or if it's developing a completely new product based on what our customers are telling us, we have that ability to be very mobile and flexible and, and put that together where, you know, working with large companies, there's just so many processes and so many people and so many approvals needed to do that. It's just an extremely, extremely um, painful process, I guess is how I'd describe it. And so um, that's one of the things that, you know, we want to do. And I do get feedback from customers about different flavor profiles that they're interested in. And I've got a list uh, that I'm kind of just keeping track of. And as we're able to do it, we're going to continue to just develop more products that are really specifically inspired by our customers. And whether it's, you know, meat snacks and shelf-stable meat snacks or whether it's other things as well, uh, we're open to it. And that's part of the reason why we named our company Sogo Snacks and not, you know, Sogo Beef Sticks or something like that because we want to have a little bit of flexibility to get into um, different snacking areas and, and bring our approach of creating it either as low sugar or no sugar as possible and as clean label as possible. Yeah, so one of the things um, that I would like you to touch on a little bit is, is your name. So it's a pretty unique name. Um, and most people would not know what that, um, what that actually means. Can you kind of sure. go into that? Yeah, so... Um, the company Sogo Snacks, Sogo is S-O-G-O, and that is actually a, a word in Bambada, which is a, a West African language spoken primarily in the country of Mali, and most people probably don't know where that is, but it's, it's the, Timbuktu is in Mali, and most people can kind of, oh, I've heard of Timbuktu. I know it's way out there, but... Um, it means meat. It Sogo means meat in the West African language of Bambara. And how I came up with that name is right after school, um, I had never really traveled internationally and wanted to do so. And my senior year, I had um, went and visited a, a Peace Corps recruiter that had come to campus. And after that presentation, I was just like, that's what I need to do. That's, that's how you, you visit a country and see the world is by... Um, going to a country, not only to, to help them, but to really learn from them and um, live your life as, as closely as you can to the way they live their life. And so when I was 22 years old, I left the United States and lived in uh, Mali, West Africa, in a village called Tene. It's about 4,000 people um, in the middle of nowhere, no electricity, no running water, no phone, um, just really nothing there except for people trying to survive. And it had a, I was there for two years and three months and it, you know, had a really profound impact on me as a person and what I wanted to do with my life. And it's something that I've just carried with me that experience, you know, ever since I left, I left Molly and uh, so I worked in a lot of the, in the nonprofit world uh, prior to getting into the grass and beef industry. And actually, while I was there, I worked in small business development and microfinance, and I did a little bit of that work here in the United States. So when I started my small business, um, I you know I kept coming back to how can I pay homage or how can I you know live or 
bring that legacy of the Peace Corps and, and the Malian people to what I'm continuing to do in my life here. And so that's where, one, I not only named my company Sogo Snacks to kind of pay tribute to the Malian people and that experience, but also one of my goals is, um, you know, making this a successful company where what we can then do is give back and doing that through nonprofits um, or, or other means, but specifically some of them being uh, a nonprofit that I, I find, I, I met the, the, the individual that started the nonprofit while I was a Peace Corps volunteer and the nonprofit's called African Sky. And they're really about bringing assistance, but sustainable assistance uh, to Mali, where it's not just um, bringing aid and b- dumping a bunch of money and then hopefully measuring some some statistics and seeing things are good, but how do you bring sustainable change where it's not um, local individuals relying on money, but using money to, as, a, as a seed source for a, a girl's education program or a school or a, a, a seed bank or, or something like that. And so it's really intentional development, and that's what I hope the success of this company can uh, support uh, as we grow. That is a pretty amazing story. Yeah, it's, you know... The, the Peace Corps was, they, they say it's the toughest job you'll ever love, and it's really cliche, but it's absolutely true. And um, that experience, like I said, I think about it every single day. I think of the people that helped me there every single day. And it's, it's not as easy as one would like to, um, after leaving and getting back into life in the United States, to kind of just figure out how to how to continue to focus on on the folks that you met there or what you learned but um that's that's what I'm trying to do as much as I can and really you know I I was helped and benefited more by the experience than any anyone that I worked with or helped over there um they're just such a generous people that really took me under their wing and you know I was essentially a baby there trying to learn everything for the first time how to eat how to walk how to talk how to go to the bathroom I mean it was so different that um, you know without the the graciousness of of the host country nationals it, it just would not have been the experience and I'm not necessarily sure that we would always uh, offer that same graciousness to other folks and so I want to I want to work towards that yeah. Well, it's a fantastic story. You, you, I love how you went through everything from quality all the way down to your values of your company, and you kind of it talks about your snacks. So, um, on your website, you've got all the nutritional information. You mean I think there's even write-ups on these, uh, these, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, volunteer, uh, I guess, companies that you're working with. So there's just tons of information on your website. So it's sogosnacks.com, and you even have a, what would you call that, a frequent, frequent awards. If, for people who come back, there is a, a program for people who continue to, to buy from your service. Yep, is, yep, yep. A, we, a rewards program or a... Rewards program, exactly, yep. And and we try, we're, we're trying to be as transparent as we can, saying, look, this is who we are, this is our company, this is what we believe in, and, and here's what we have to offer. And if this is something that resonates with you and you want to support, we'd love to have it. Um, if it's not, then um, at least there's no pretending, and um, we're not just trying to sell a product to sell a product. We're it's it's really truly something that we believe in, and so we're just we're throwing it all out there and just you know trying to be as transparent as we can. So, Dan, if there's somebody who's interested um, in starting a business or um, maybe is just just starting out in a business, is there anything um, that you wish that you would have known up front that would have helped in the beginning? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, I guess I've always liked to... I, I like to start things small. That's just what I feel comfortable with. Maybe that's what my my risk my risk um, comfort is about. Uh, and so I think it's it has served me well to really start small. But it's also a competitive world out there, 
And if you have a good idea or you're doing something, um, other people can most of the time uh, replicate that and do something similar. And so at one point or at some point, you really do have to be willing to kind of take that leap of faith and, and jump outside of your comfort zone. And um, sometimes that just you know, revolves around needing to hire more people to help you. And I'm kind of going through that process right now saying, you know, I can't do this all if I want to survive as a company. I need help. And so you know, it can be hard letting go uh, and hard finding the right people. But that's something that I'm trying to do. And even like capital, even if you're a successful company, um, the more success, successful you are, um, the, the more challenging cash flow can be uh, because you're needing to have um, larger and larger amounts of inventory and you're going to need to spend more money in marketing or, or other arenas. And so uh, even though you're successful, it doesn't mean you have the cash that you need to invest in all the different aspects that the company needs to grow. And so just making sure that, that you go into it uh, knowing that and knowing at some point you're going to have to really leverage things that you don't always necessarily feel comfortable leveraging, um, that's necessary and it's really a part of being successful because um, there's somebody else that's going to be doing that and that's the person that will make your success even more challenging. So those are two things. Um, trying to think if there's a, another something else off the top of my head. I, I, I guess a positive, you know, a really positive thing that I wasn't sure of going into it is just the amount of support that you can get from customers when when you are, um, you know, creating or offering a product or service that you truly believe in and that, that shares the values that you have because it's a big world out there. And you know, I'm located in Northeast Iowa in a really small town, but most of my customers are are not here. They're they're on the coast or in larger cities or in urban areas. And it's been really wonderful for me just to see the support that I'm getting from folks um, across the country that um, you know like the way our company is running and likes the the products that we're providing. And it gives me a lot of, I guess, confidence and excitement to know that um, you get that that type of support from customers that you don't even know and that are a long ways away from where you are. Fantastic. Well, is there anything that that we've maybe left out of this interview that or, or you'd like to uh, add in before we close it out? I guess another thing that I would just add is is the the experience that my family had at KetoCon. Um, it was really the first experience that we had going to a large conference and, and sampling our product. And so I would say we were a little green in that area and we weren't sure what to expect, but we, you know, we hopped in our minivan and as a family, we drove down there and just uh, the amount of enthusiasm and the incredible people that we met at KetoCon was just very energizing for us. And we left that experience, you know, one, really excited uh, and just and happy that we went and had that opportunity to go there. But then even afterwards, uh, the, the support that we've continued to, to have from people that we met at KetoCon has just been incredible. And it's really made us excited to, to do more of that. So uh, just a, a plug on, on what a great experience that was. And we look forward to coming back in the future. Well, I think part of that was your company and business, right? I mean, it, it's it's the your your passion is uh, contagious, which is pretty impressive. Oh, well, thank you very much. So you were lucky enough to get Sogo Snacks on pretty much all the social medias. It's your web page, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. So we'll put all that information in the show notes if you flip over. But uh, if there's anything else. Yeah, I just want to tell you that I would never have guessed you'd be green um, at the conference. I thought you guys did well. <laughs> and the one thing that I um, that stood out to me was your unique um, business cards that you had. I thought that, that was a very um, very neat idea that you use your um, the tips of your your beef sticks as your business cards. And when I yeah. 
package. No, that yeah, that's been fun. We we love doing that because I'm you know I'm so bad with paper and I do everything online and so I get business cards and information and it just it gets lost with with our household and so I, I yeah that was just something that we thought hey this would be a great way to kind of get our information out there and so yeah it's it's a fun way to do it. Yeah, it was definitely memorable. And yeah, well that's great. I'm glad to hear that. All right, Dan. Well, we appreciate you taking the time out of your, out of your schedule to uh, kind of do this with us. We, we, we like to hear people's experiences and, and, and kind of feel that passion with you. So we really appreciate you spending the time with us. Oh, you're, you're certainly welcome, and, and thanks for having me. Yeah. Okay, you want to hang tight for just a second? We'll do closing, and then uh, we'll, we'll rejoin you in just a second. Okay, Dan? Sounds great. Great. All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening in. Um...